Well, right on 6.30, this might as well start. So thank you very much for coming. And as I mentioned last time, I was planning to um, begin again. This has been a series of six lectures and over about uh, three years. And uh, there's only so much you can say on Parkinson's, so I thought I'd repeat myself and uh, bring you up to date with what is new. So um, what I wanted to talk about today is the idea about what causes Parkinson's and before doing that I think I need to go through some almost uh, background ideas about what when doctors talk about illnesses we actually use a shorthand idea about what we're really thinking about. So very commonly the idea of a disease is like um, a condition like smallpox. You can catch it and uh, you know what it the people now know what the, um, the infectious agent or the instigating agent is, it's a virus and if you inoculate it or treat it and remove that instigating agent then the disease goes away. And so this idea of a simple or a direct cause that can be removed and uh, the effect of the disease is the common idea that I think in the public particularly people hold about disease and indeed I think many doctors do as well. But degenerative diseases in general, and by that we mean diseases in which that there is a slow progression uh, due to some event which is causing injury to, the, to particular cell systems, are different. And the way of explaining that difference is to perhaps use an analogy like heart disease. And I think it's important we talk about this because Parkinson's isn't like smallpox, there isn't a single entity and most of us think that it's probably more like heart disease in terms of a model of understanding what the condition is. So a divergence and a little history about heart disease. 200 years ago there wasn't really an idea about what heart disease was. There was this condition called dropsy which consisted of accumulation of fluids in the body and people had some idea about what the mechanisms were, but there was, it was recognised that this was a problem which um, eventually led to shortness of breath and people being bedridden and unable to get around. But over the ensuing years, it was recognised that this was called, but caused by troubles in the heart and troubles in the kidney, and that it was uh, eventually recognised that this was because these, can, these two organs had failed or reached the end of their uh, useful function. In the last hundred years though, it's been recognised that heart disease is caused by this end stage process of heart failure, if you like, the uh, accumulation of fluid and dropsy has been caused by many things including this idea of a heart attack, muscle disease in the heart muscle, problems with high blood pressure, difficulty within the heart valves are all ways of actually causing heart failure. But it still didn't give a clue about what was actually the cause, the upstream event. So that then led to further research which has particularly happened over the last 60 years that what leads to a heart attack is actually due to atheroma building up in, heart, in blood vessels and disorders of clotting in leading to blockage of blood vessels, fragments of material leading to blockage of blood vessels or infections that also lead to block, blockage of blood vessels. And so then there's this idea that this was upstream or uh, at least causative but still there was this question well what sets atheroma going or um, cholesterol, the, high, you know, the, the blockage or the, the uh, occlusion of the arteries. And that eventually led to the recognition that really well actually there isn't a single cause, in fact there's only risk factors and these include things like hypertension, diabetes, smoking, high cholesterol or lipids and some genetic factors and so really there is no single cause but really a set of susceptibilities which once they begin a process lead to eventually the problem where the organ fails and doesn't work. And I think that this idea of um, what's going on in a degenerative disease is really a good model for thinking about what causes Parkinson's and I'm going to, st fortunately Parkinson's isn't a series of blank boxes but research has helped to start to fill it in and what I'm going to do today is to try and step backwards um, and try and fill in the boxes and tell you where we're up to and where the problems are facing us. So 
I'm going to go right back to the beginning, which is um, 1817, when James Parkinson's wrote the original description of what uh, Parkinson's looks like. And in some ways, this is the beginning of the story where if we're using the heart disease analogy, this is going back to dropsy. Just an aside, I've probably said to you this before, is that uh, James Parkinson very nearly was Australia's first neurologist because he became very close to being deported for political um, left-leaning views and was saved by uh, um, important benefactors from coming and being our first neurologist. And whether he would have described Parkinson's or not, I don't know. Things moved slowly though at that time. It uh, wasn't until 1895 that the next discovery, and that was that the problem in Parkinson's was due to these nerve cells here in a substance called, place called the substantia nigra, and it was called the substantia nigra because in people, obviously this isn't a normal brain because the person's dead, but um, if you were able to look inside the intact healthy brain, you'd find that there was an, a black area and that was why it got the name of sub substantia nigra, which is in Latin black substance. And in Parkinson's disease, that black area disappears, and it's in this part of the brain, just up here. And that occurs when about 50 to 70 percent, the symptoms begin when 50 to 70 percent of the cells here. And this chap, Brissau, was the first to identify that there were cell losses in this area in Parkinson's. And the next big step was from a, another gentleman who's a German but working in Paris at the time who discovered these things which have his name and they're called Lewy bodies. And this is a nerve cell in that part of the brain called the substantia nigra or SN. And these pale pink things are clumps of protein sitting inside the cell. And he described these as being present in the nerve cells of the brain of people with Parkinson's and they still carry his name and called Lewy bodies. At the time it wasn't at all clear what these Lewy bodies actually were. Next big step forward came in the 50s and 60s where uh, uh, Dr. Carlson in uh, Gothenburg in Sweden discovered the dopamine system and recognised that dopamine was the main cell a main substance that was causing the blackness in the substantia nigra and working with other colleagues there was the discovery that L-dopa which uh, con converts into dopamine is um, uh, able to uh, be effective in people with Parkinson's disease and these gentlemen along with a couple of others received the Nobel Prize for this work of recognising that the dopamine system and its use in Parkinson's and a lot of this was described in the film Awakenings, those of you who perhaps have seen that film. And the big discovery of the modern times was about um, 15 years ago, a little bit more than that, when a, um, this group found that a protein called alpha-synuclein that the mutation, and I'm going to talk about what that means, caused a um, form of inherited Parkinson's and it looked pretty similar to the sort of Parkinson's that James Parkinson described. So this is a rare condition, but the real excitement came when a year later this same protein which was mutated was found to be the main protein in the middle of the Lewy body inside the cell. And so that then led to the idea that either alpha-synuclein's misbehaviour was a key factor in setting the Lewy body going and therefore perhaps a process that led to uh, Parkinson's becoming established or that in fact it was very close to the action and was perhaps a bystander caught up in the, in the pathological process. So the discoveries that give us, these discoveries give us clue to the cause and that's what we're concentrating on tonight. And the idea of whereabouts in the brain, this discovery of Brissau and the uh, Dahlstrom and the Carlsberg and co, the discovery that we're in the brain and the fact that it's dopamine in these parts of the brain, that leads us to the idea of the, what, are the, what causes the symptoms of Parkinson's and leads us to think about what is it about those cells which cause the symptoms of Parkinson's that are particularly susceptible to undergoing cell death in Parkinson's disease. 
And so that's a key area and idea of research looking for risk and I'm going to talk a bit about that. And the second key idea is that what are the mechanisms that alpha-synuclein getting into the Lewy body actually leads to these pathological processes and therefore lead to the underlying mechanisms that cause cell death in these susceptible cells. So I'm going to now take these ideas and go through them one by one, talking about factors that lead to the susceptibility and the mechanisms. So first of all, this idea of where in the brain and how does it produce symptoms. So Brissauer showed that this is where the problem was and that it was these cells. But how do they actually cause the problems in Parkinson's? Well, this is the brain of a monkey, this is the brain of a human, and one of the big differences is this part of the brain, the frontal lobes at the beginning. And these areas, these projections of these dopamine cells go to the part of the brain that service this area, both the smaller area in the monkey and the bigger area in the human, which leads us to an idea that some of the roles that dopamine is producing is to make this part of the brain work properly. Now, we know that in, um, in movement and probably other forms of disease that dopamine is very important in learning skilled movements. And the reason this car with an L plate up there is up there is that if you cast your mind back to when you first began driving, all, when you're sitting in the car, all of your attention is, driven at, is directed at getting the gears and the clutch and everything to work and you can't pay attention to either who's in front of you or what else is going to happen. But as that becomes automatic, then you can pay attention to what you're going to do. And that process of making it automatic is one of the key features of the role of dopamine, and that's one of the things that gets disturbed if you haven't got a sufficient amount of dopamine is to be able to call on these automatic movements at the time that they should occur. And Part of the reason that this frontal lobe needs this automatic function is that for reasons of evolution that I don't, won't have time to really discuss in detail at present, there's only a certain amount of things that we can pay attention to at once. And if we have to pay attention to how to change gears and drive the car, we're never going to be able to pay attention to managing the road and the traffic lights and the traffic and the pedestrians, etc. And similarly, all of the other activities in the brain are allow allowing us automatically to take away load on the attention mechanism so that you can cast that attention at the things that are in hand, both the dangerous and the important ones, without being distracted by being able to carry out skilled movements. And this is just as true for being able to speak a language, when you first learn to speak a foreign language, you're th busy thinking about how you're going to get the words to work. When it becomes automatic, you don't actually have to think about that anymore. When you do arithmetic, one of the reasons we learn times tables and all of these other skills is so that we don't have to think about this when we're actually automatically thinking about the tasks at which you want to put the arithmetic to. So it goes to all sorts of activities. An idea about how this works, and I'm going to talk a bit about it briefly, is that this is a very old experiment um, done in the 1980, and this area up here is the command centre for making muscles work. And this is a brain scan that this uh, man, Pear Rowland, did on uh, human subjects, and he asked them to make a simple movement like this, and he found that this part of the brain, we call the motor cortex, lit up, and that was not very surprising and was quite ex expected. But then if you ask the subjects to make really a learnt movement, a bit along the lines of what we're talking about, where you had to remember to move the fingers in a particular sequence, say like two, four, three, five, uh, four, three, two, or some pattern like that, and had to remember what that pattern is and make it in that order. So there was a bit of skill or learning behind it then not only did the motor cortex work up, but this area here, which we call the supplementary motor area, also became involved. So again, that at the time was not entirely unexpected, but it was interesting. But the really interesting idea that he had was then he asked subjects to not make any movement at all, but just imagine making the movements with the fingers. So he, the person who actually measured the muscle to make sure they weren't moving, 
and found that just the supplementary motor area worked and the, muscle and the motor area was silent. And this led to the proposal that the idea or the plan of the movement must be sitting in this part of the brain. And this led to, the, you know, the, I won't go through the physiology of it, but the idea that came out is that this part of the brain, the supplementary motor area, contains chunks of movement which are remembered. And so this is the Moonlight Sonata, and if you look at the time key up here, it means that these notes here have to be produced in 90 milliseconds. And if you took a, a clump of movement like this, this, say, four notes, uh, you'll imagine how fast they have to do. This is Brett Lee, so from crease to crease, five notes would be, have to be played by the time the ball left his hand and passed the wicket in most of us, I would think. So, in other words, there isn't time to get the message that you've made the note, hear whether it's correct, and then make the next one. In fact, it's all done too quickly and it's produced in this idea of a chunk or a, of, or a complex movement or a chunk of movements. And so these are produced bit by bit. And so, to some extent, the idea goes like this. That there's the chunk, some external cue like the conductor battens occur and the first note is downloaded and into the motor cortex to use a computer analogy and a message is sent down to the spinal cord to execute, make the muscles get going. But a copy of that message is sent into the area where dopamine is involved and that sends an early signal up to there to say play the next cut note and get it going and that means that that's where this executed or learned set of events is set in motion by a single cue which is uh, learnt linking these two ideas together. And this is the sort of thing that we think that happens as you learn the movements, you get these clumps together one by one, that there's, this is my daughter who doesn't do this now when she writes, um, and so she's learnt to actually drop these inefficient bits out and make the cues more and more accurate, but when she's making the movement initially, in fact these movements are very like someone who has Parkinson's movements, and in fact I should have put this in the picture today, but if I write with my, I'm very right-handed, and if I write with my left hand and measure the movements, they are very similar to someone who has Parkinson's disease, indicating that if I have to concentrate on the movements and how to make them, writing exactly the same word as here, it takes me twice as long, the amplitude is reduced, all of the cues that happen with Parkinson's, and I have lots of extra little bits of movement inserted in much the same way as she is doing. So the learnt movement is, becomes expedited and done in chunks without any unwanted movement and is done very quickly because of that cueing process. Um, and we think that what happens then in Parkinson's is that these expedited movements with the cues coming one by one fail so that the first cue can occur and the movement begins but it gets progressively smaller as it proceeds which is why the handwriting and other movements don't have the same persistence and fade away over, over time and are not able to be maintained unless concentration is directed at providing the cues voluntarily. Now, of course, if you're thinking about doing that, then of course you can't pay attention to what you actually intended to make the movement for. So that's a little brief discourse about how we've come to understand how dopamine and the regions that are affected actually lead to the symptoms of Parkinson's disease and now there's an understanding that a number of different conditions, not just par idiopathic Parkinson's but a number of other similar looking conditions can actually produce the same set of symptoms that look like Parkinson's disease and we call that Parkinsonism and we know that it's due to disturbed signalling of the basal ganglia. So then the question comes is well how do we know which is Parkinson's disease and which are the things that look alike? Well, that leads us to this question of saying, well, can we understand the mechanism? Is the mechanism different in the, if you like, the true Parkinson's for the look-alike cousins that uh, can masquerade as this? And the, these masqueraders are things like multi-systems atrophy or progressive supranuclear palsy, which in the last 50 years have all been split off because now we know they don't have the mechanisms I'm going to talk to you about. So I highlighted before that um, 
the Lewy bodies, which are, were found under the microscope by um, the Dr. Lewy in 1912, uh, that um, are now mainly filled with this protein called alpha-synuclein. And so the question then is, how does alpha-synuclein cause trouble? And to do this, I'm going to have to take you on a little side issue around a little bit on how the cell works. And that some of you will have heard this before, so I'm sorry about the repeat of the tutorial. But the cell has a number of components to them, which in a sense we can break up as functional ideas. In the middle is the nucleus, which contains, contains DNA, which is the blueprint for how to make proteins. And this is a key process, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this in a minute, but it's a key process. Proteins are the, the main building blocks and engines and executors of cell function, and they're a key process. The blueprint is then sent out into this process called the endoplasmic reticulum, which indeed is really the factory which copies the blueprint to make the proteins, which are then used either within the cell or else exported to have function for other uh, cells nearby or around the body or are sent down the, the, um, to other parts of the cell to be used in that, uh, that region. That's very important for nerve cells, even the export to distant parts of the cell itself. Then there's also a engine room which produces energy. These are called mitochondria. And as in any power station, the production of energy produces unwanted byproducts, which if they get into the wrong area is going to cause damage. In the mammalian cells, we fix oxygen to turn them into energy. And the process of using that oxygen produces uh, free radicals and other types of little uh, small chemicals which can be very damaging both to DNA, other proteins and cellular function. And so keeping this in check and maintaining the right amount of energy is an important key function to proper cell function. And finally, there's got to be a garbage disposal system. And this is particularly important in nerve cells because these are a, an unusual type of cell in that they are we have one, when you, the nerve cell is born, almost all of them stay with you lifelong. And so that means that housekeeping is really important because uh, if you don't clean out the rubbish, it accumulates. If you are too efficient in cleaning it out, it's not very energetically effective and you end up uh, using far too much energy to make new proteins than, than uh, is efficient or is what's required. And I've highlighted each of these because each of them are suspected of paying a part in actually the processes which may set Parkinson's in motion. So, first of all about alpha-synuclein itself. Even though we've known about this protein for a long time, we still don't really know what it does. It's got its name because syn is because it short for being at synapses, which are the connecting parts of one nerve cell to another, and we know that a lot of it's there. And nucleon, because it also is found in large amounts inside the nucleus of cells. It's unclear what it does, and there's been a lot of time trying to understand that, and as best we understand, it's involved in chaperoning or helping those uh, uh, pieces of uh, cargo which are going to be exported to hooking them up to the export sites and, and passing them on, which is an important process both at the synapse and in trafficking um, materials up and down the, the cell's highway system. Now, when alpha-synuclein becomes uh, misused or becomes uh, out of date or damaged, it's normally a soluble molecule floating around in the cell and soluble mo molecules are disposed of through a disposal system called the proteasome, and that's the normal housekeeping me mechanism of clearing away damaged, these sorts of soluble damaged proteins. But if something happens, and we think this is particularly the case in, in Parkinson's, to make the alpha-synuclein less soluble, then in its insoluble form, for some reason or other, it seems to become toxic. And that's been one of the big hunts to actually understand why that occurs. And one, we think that one of the processes that the cell does is to try and sequester away these insoluble 
forms into a dump here, into big aggregates which eventually become recognisable inside the cell, which effectively is the Lewy body. And so we think that the Lewy body is the result of the cell trying to pull this away into a toxic dump and putting a membrane around it so it doesn't cause damage to the cell. And thus, while this is the hallmark of there being a uh, disorder in the cell, it's actually probably the cell's best endeavours to keep things under check. So going back to our garbage disposal system, there are two types of garbage disposal system, but it seems that this one is not being used properly and so as a result there is accumulation of material within the cell. The second thing is that we also know that dopamine itself, which is perhaps why d dopamine cells become susceptible, because we know that these Lewy bodies don't just occur in dopamine cells in Parkinson's, they occur in many other cells and I'm going to talk a little bit about that shortly. But it seems that dopamine in particular may be important about shifting the balance between soluble to insoluble, making dopamine cells more susceptible than other cells in the brain. And then finally, we also know, and this is how the whole process was discovered, that mutations in alpha-synuclein also make it insoluble. And so, again, I'll just give you briefly a little tutorial about alpha-synuclein and genetics. The gene alphabet has four letters. They're just called A, T, C and G for short. And three letters is the word coding for an amino acid and a protein is a string of amino acids. So that's how the genes actually code for the protein that you want to make because they put in the alphabet the spelling of all of the amino acids that have to be built. So a mutation is a mistake in the transcription or the letters used for making an amino acid. And so the sorts of mistakes can be that if we're thinking that you're coding for the word peace, it might be a spelling error like putting an I instead of an E. It wouldn't be a disaster because we would probably be able to figure out what the meaning of the sentence is. It might make it a little bit less efficient, but it wouldn't be a, uh, make the protein or the word entirely dysfunctional. But it could be a major misspelling which makes the word lose its meaning or value entirely and therefore has a significant effect on the function of the protein. And so mutations are like this. They can be a troublesome misspelling, fairly minor misspelling or a major misspelling causing, causing difficulty. And so when we look in the DNA, the DNA is really made up of strings of these spelling three letter words or codes of uh, gene alphabet strung together and these one words like CTT using the gene spelling would spell out the amino acid leucine and so if there was a mistake in there so the wrong you wouldn't get leucine you'd get another amino acid. So in Parkinson's disease this side of sort of big mistake is rare. In fact it was serendipitous that that first mutation in alpha-synuclein was actually found uh, in a uh, rare fam form of familial Parkinson's in mainly in Greek families. And these type of problems account for less than 5% of Parkinson's. And as we've begun to understand it, it's probably the amount of Parkinson's due to a single big mistake is become, thought to be becoming increasingly less common. These type that are produced by that might just make it a little less functional, like a minor spelling mistake. We, think th we used to think they were uncommon. We're now beginning to suspect that they are increasingly more common. How common, we don't know. We know that these two, I'm going to talk about them in all, they've got these usually rather uncomprehensible uh, fruit salads, but this is the uh, Goucher-related protein, and this is another one which uh, you don't really need to know what it stands for. But they are very, very important in terms of uh, producing risk factors in Ashkenazi Jews, but probably not in people without that hereditary background. And our thinking is that these may not be genes that necessarily cause Parkinson's, but they put you at risk if there are other enabling factors that might be there. And I'm going to use an example here from diabetes. This is not to say that this is 
diabetes in this setting is related to Parkinson's, it's just to use it as an example. So people from the Cook Islands and the Polynesian regions didn't have Parkinson's, uh, didn't have diabetes, I'm sorry, until the arrival of Western diets. And since the arrival of Western diets, the incidence of diabetes has gone up to about 70%. So we now have a strong suspicion that this is due to a genetic predisposition that because the diets prior to the arrival of the Western, um, the, uh, the Western world was rich in protein and poor in calorie, it was a diet, they had a genetic predisposition which hoarded calories when it was available. Now when presented a diet which is the other way around, high in calories, then they're still hoarding the calories, put on weight and have a great risk of diabetes. So a genetic risk factor which is good for you in one certain circumstances becomes bad for you in another environmental setting. And our suspicion is that a number of these enabling genes might be like this. And the problem is we just don't know what the environmental factors are in, in Parkinson's that might be enabling it. And I'm going to again come back to what some of these might be, might be in a minute. So in the case of the ones we do know, the gene for alpha-synuclein, the one for Goucher protein, and the one for this leucine-rich repeat kinase 2, very informative name. Um, well, we know that the alpha-synuclein, the gene, the mutation in it leads to increased rate of misfolding, and you can even show that in the test tube by putting alpha-synuclein protein with a mutation in it. It will aggregate faster than um, that without. The Goucher protein is very much involved in the making of little packages of protein that have to be exported and that's it's, it's a key protein and, and Goucher's disease, which is a major mutation in this protein, um, they basically have a failure of export entirely. But it seems that this minor disturbance puts people at risk in Parkinson's. And this other protein nicknamed LARC2 um, is involved in the uh, disposal of the soluble form of alpha-synuclein which I talked about and seems to put that, uh, in, that soluble form, disturb it, pushing the process inside of the insoluble form. So it seems that in the case of these genetic factors and other factors, it's really the matter of tipping the balance away from this system so LARC2 tips the balance in this direction, dopamine tips the balance in this direction, Gaucher's disease tips the balance in that way, and the mutations in alpha-synuclein tip the risk factor in that way. So our thinking about most of the genetic factors is that it's not so much that they have that problem, you will get it, it's rather that it tips the, this way so that something else, and that's not really clear what it is, can then is more likely to play a part when that is present. Now, I'm just again going to I'm going to come back to that issue of what might tip it in the right direction, in the wrong direction in a minute, but I want to also just firstly talk about this other clue which has come up in recent times around this idea of can alpha-synuclein spread its problem. So about uh, 20 years ago it became apparent that people with Parkinson's disease are much more likely to have lost their sense of smell some to many years prior to the onset of the, the diagnosis. And similarly, constipation is far more common in people with Parkinson's of the same age than the rest of the community. Now that's not to say that you can make sense the other way around and say if you've got a loss of sense of smell or constipation that you've got a risk of Parkinson's, but it's just pointing out that the risk factor. That idea just sat there for a while until in 2002 an Austrian pathologist by the name of Brach did an extensive study on post-mortems of people who had died uh, by car accidents or uh, heart disease or other reasons and he did a systematic search of the nervous system looking for these Lewy bodies to see where they were. And what he found was that you, he made the hypothesis that actually you, you always find it in the gut and you'll find it in the gut before you find it anywhere else in the brain and you find it in the olfactory system before you find it anywhere else in the brain. And then the next 
common association is gut and the lower part of the brain, which may be involved in troubles with sleep. And the next association is gut, lower part of the brain and the substantia nigra, which is uh, about the time that the diagnosis is made. And then last of all, gut, brainstem, lower part of the brain and cortex. So he put up this proposal that there is this spread through the nervous system that alpha synuclein is either in the gut or enters the gut. This is one of the great questions we don't know. Travels from nerve cell to nerve cell up the brainstem to the substantia nigra and then to the cortex. Now we now know that if you inject alpha synuclein into the brains of mice that neighbouring nerve cells will take it up if you put mutant forms of alpha-synuclein into brains of mice, neighbouring cells are more readily likely to take it up. And this has led to this idea, but not proven, that in some way something, oops, something might be setting it in motion and allowing it to spread in some way. Now, I stress this is still a hypothesis, it's still an idea, although there is increasing amount of weight around it to think that this might be going on. And this again leads to the question, well, what might be factors that lead that to occur? And uh, so, you know, does it enter via the gut nose? Is it environmental? And are the factors that can prevent or slow this and how do you slow its spread? And again, there's a lot more evidence to show that that might be doable than actually understanding this first two questions at this stage. So, if we come back to saying, you know, this was the idea we had about heart disease, so what do we now know about Parkinson's? So if we think of what James Parkinson's disease said, that's by the time you see Parkinson's disease, about 60 to 70 percent of the nerve cells in the nigra have already been lost. And so this is quite a long way, whether it's right to call it a failed organ is perhaps a bit too strong, but it's a long way down the way. And we know that there's a string of conditions now which cause loss of or impaired dopamine signal and loss of function of this part of the brain. And they include idiopathic Parkinson's or the common Parkinson's. And what, this is what we normally mean when we just use the short term Parkinson's disease. Genetic Parkinson's, this is the, just the, the serious mistake in the gene form, which we have peeled off as a second condition. And these other conditions like multi-systems atrophy, progressive supranuclear palsy and many others which are considered to be the cousins. And so the question is what makes it going and what are the risk factors? Well there are some clues around the risk factors and the, the point about disease onset is that we know that before diagnosis that many people have trouble with this thing called uh, rapid eye movement sleep disorder in which people act out their dreams uh, and um, call out and shout out and move their limbs. And we think that, as Brach had suggested, this might be because of involvement of particular cell groups in the brainstem before the alpha-synuclein is spread up to the, to the midbrain. And the question of whether constipation and sense of smell is actually a sign of some of this pre-symptomatic disease. So what are the risks? So there is a suggestion that diabetes and obesity might be a predisposing factor. There are cohort studies that suggest a risk factor for Parkinson's, but on the other hand, to just confuse this, and this is always where medicine ends up in the early stages, there are case control studies that suggest it's the other way around. So we're really not sure just what that story is, and so the evidence there is inconclusive. But there are two interesting stories. One is about exenatide, which is a drug which I've mentioned in recently in a previous lecture, and a protein called amylin. So exenatide is an anti-Parkinson's drug which causes weight loss as a side effect. And uh, in a recent small study for Parkinson's disease um, where they compared a placebo and the active drug, and they compared people in the off state, that is, you know, with no drugs, and they compared them before and after 18 months of treatment and the treated group had deteriorated significantly less than the, uh, the placebo group both in terms of motor function, that's in terms of movement, but also in terms of thinking. And so this has been very tantalising and there are a lot of uh, 
when I say a lot, there's about four studies now, big studies that are underway using either exenatide or other ones to see whether this is really going to hold up and has really got um, substance to the idea. And people looking and saying, well, is it really exenatide or is it weight loss or is it glucose control? And the reason that weight loss is tantalizing is that we've known for a long time that people and mice, but particularly mice, who are kept on near starvation diets live a lot longer and have much less susceptibility to nervous system injury. So again, not proven, but they are tantalizing ideas. Now, another interesting idea is amylin, which is a protein from the pancreas which controls ins insulin that's linked to diabetes too by causing aggregation of uh, uh, some of the insulin related proteins in a bit the same way as it occurs to with Lewy bodies, but this occurs in, in the pancreas. But the link is that amylin enters the brain and it binds to alpha-synuclein in a particular part of the um, alpha-synuclein which we know is an important factor for causing aggregation and at least in the test tube, amylin can make alpha-synuclein aggregate and it seems to aggregate at least in uh, in some models in the regions where we would expect if uh, Parkinson's was involved. It was involved in Parkinson's, I should say. So these two ideas lead us to think, well, there may be environmental risk factors around either obesity, lack of exercise, or weight uh, or diabetes itself that might be relevant. Lack of exercise is another idea, and the what we know here is that um, exercise leads to release of a protein called GDNF or glial derived neurotrophic factor and this is important for keeping dopamine cells alive. You have to have GDNF for the dopamine cells to stay functional and if you produce um, Parkinson's like uh, events in a, in a rat and then force the animal to use the arm that would be affected then you can substantially slow down or even prevent the effect of the toxin that would cause the cell death. And this led to trials of GDNF in, in humans which showed great promise and looked like they would be effective but had to be stopped mainly because of safety but not because of efficacy. So again this tantalizing question that somehow or other exercise or involvement of that in some way is important. Another risk factor that has kept on coming up is insecticides. And we know that Parkinson's is more common in rural regions than in the city. And for example, in Australia, it's more common in areas that have had insecticide use, like the Goldman Valley and the northwest e region of Tasmania, um, in parts of the Hunter Valley and around um, the fruit growing areas of South Australia. Uh, leading again to these, you know, that would fit with this disposition. In the EU, we know that um, uh, in regions that, that you can plot the incidence of Parkinson's according to the use of insecticide as a broad statement across the um, areas of France and Germany. But every time people pick out particular culprits, it's just not been possible to prove that there is either a smoking gun for all of them or that one in particular one is the likely factor. So all we're left is these correlations which make us think that this might be relevant and there is experimental regions, reasons why we would think that insecticides could be um, proteins that would impair the power stations of the, of the neurons as well as the export systems of the, of the neurons. So again, a tantalizing clue as to the risks, but we don't know. Another clue is cigarettes. So smokers, uh, one of the few it's probably the only condition I can think of where you're better off if you don't smoke, if you do smoke. So for reasons that are not clear, smokers, um, non-smokers uh, have a greater risk of getting Parkinson's. And this has led to people think that, is it the nicotine or something in the cigarettes that are protective? Uh, a view that I think is more plausible is that there's something about the brain functions of people with Parkinson's, who are prone to Parkinson's disease means that they are less likely to be looking for undertaking uh, drug use or uh, drug seeking behaviours and so that they are less likely to smoke because they make their own dopamine. Now we don't know which is the right answer but so far all of the attempts to try and use 
uh, nicotine-like agents, etc., have not been successful in Parkinson's, uh, uh, in, in smokers or uh, non-smokers in protecting against Parkinson's. So again, we don't know, but it's a tantalising observation and it's very robust. So when we look at um, the risk factors and fill in the, blo the dots, we can say, well, there are risk factors here how important and how much they will hold up, we don't really know. But if we think now of where the research is going, is that in each of these cases, there's steps which are about understanding how does alpha-synuclein cause pathology within cells and how does its misbehavior or how might that lead to the trouble that's seen. But increasingly, there are attempts to try and study either disease right at the onset or even look beyond earlier into the disease using biomarkers to try and identify people who will be at high risk of disease so that it's better able to study what particular factors about lifestyle and their activities that are at risk. So there are big studies, for example, of people amongst, uh, particularly in Israel and Miami, where there are uh, large concentrations of uh, Ashkenazi Jews and therefore people who are carriers of the LARC2 and the GBA gene to actually study which of the people who end up with early disease onset versus late disease onset with the assumption that this must be risk factors that are doing it. Now most of the people who are here are probably interested in this because they've got people who are at this stage but it is relevant for all of all of people who might be troubled by Parkinson's to actually understand this because the factors which are going to slow the progression of disease are probably going to be found by understanding the events that are happening here. So let me give you an example. If someone has heart disease, it's still well worth trial stopping smoking, treating the diabetes, reducing your cholesterol, treating the hypertension. So mitigating against the risk slows the progression of heart failure or late, later stage disease. And so it's almost certain that understanding the factors which slow the progression will be relevant even once the disease is established. But there's even greater reason as well to think about this and that is that the chances of finding a drug that works is going to be much easier looking at the early stages of the disease than later on because it's going to be harder to slow the loss of the cells when there's say 20% left, it's harder to see the effect of that than say looking at the difference between 80 and 50% or 80 and 70%. So that's where I was going to go to. Once again, I'll put in an advertisement for the Australian Parkinson's Disease Registry for all of those who would like to participate, but i um, very happy to answer questions. Yes. It would be. I think, unfortunately, the, it's sort of a bit too late because of the naming problems, and um, which is uh, the reason too why we don't. We've there's been this consensus over a time to talk about Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism to try and separate across uh, from the conditions we actually have identified, like MSA and PSP, but. Um, there's a lot of discussion still about whether in fact calling something like idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which is in a sense what's left of this other condition, is a good thing to do because in a sense it obscures the discussion about whether this is really one condition or several conditions or as you rightly say, something like heart failure, which is a useful term in, for the cardiac doctors, but it means something very different now from a disease. Yeah. With reference to the SMA um, and the fact that there were two different areas of the brain, is there any possibility that um, because it, the second part sort of uh, consolidates groups of activity, that mental, mental activity, uh, strong mental activity, like you mentioned, uh, learning languages or maybe playing the moon arts and after, X, not so much as a risk factor, but a preventative factor. Yeah, so 
I wasn't meaning to suggest that these were risk factors, but more to just explain how that part of the brain works. And one of the things we do know, sort of a, uh, before Parkinson's treatments of any form was available, there's a very famous story about a, um, a fire in a nursing home where, which had a lot of people with Parkinson's. And of course, without any treatment, it meant that people's movements became much more rapidly uh, put them into nursing homes. Now the surprising thing with this fire was that although the nursing home burnt down, nobody was killed. And it was discovered that almost all of the patients had been able to get themselves out of their bed, down the stairs, it was a two-storey building, and entirely on their own. And what this highlights is that yes, there are ways of activating the motor systems. It's not that they're paralysed but they are not available to be activated or easily activated during the ordinary way that we would use them when attention is elsewhere. And so there's this clear idea that there are several ways that the motor system can be activated. And the difficulty is that it's not a good idea to put people under the sort of sheer terror that this would have happened. <laughs> and so it's quite hard to activate it. But there are some studies going on at present using a form of brain stimulation which works on these areas. So in other words, you, to see whether you can use stimulators on the surface of the brain to activate the supplementary motor system more readily and bypass the Parkinson's areas as it were using a machine type approach. So much the same way as the other stimulators currently work. So again, this is all research in a way of trying to get around that problem. But in terms of your last question, we don't know yet whether, um, whether practice of motor functions actually uh, improve uh, chunking activity when you've got Parkinson's. We know that it does when the brain is healthy. So whether that actually is useful in terms of prevention later on, nobody knows that at all. But um, I think that the the other thing which we know is that with Parkinson's is that if there is events that are actually distracting people so that they're using up their attentional span or capacities, then that's when they function less well. So being put under stress and using up that, that ability to pay attention to things such as with anxiety or stress that that has a quite a deleterious effect on um, a deleterious effect on motor function. Excuse me, what is REM sleep? Sorry. REM sleep. What is what is REM sleep? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, when we um, when we go to sleep, the walnut on the top of the brain, which is the thinking part of the brain involved in memories and planning and organisation is disconnected from the spinal cord and the motor system down the bottom. And that's a normal thing that occurs when we go to sleep. Now, during sleep, we have a stage of sleep called rapid eye movement sleep, which is what REM stands for. And that's, we think, when dreams and consolidation of memory and um, uh, other processes are occurring in the brain. Now, because there's a disconnection between our recollections and going through things, we don't actually move. But you see examples where they are reconnected, for example, people who sleepwalk. That's connected back up again. And so we think that what happens is that there are brief reconnections when people have these REM sleep disorders. Now dopamine is very important in this. We don't quite know how, but dopamine is a, is a, a molecule that's involved in waking up and going to sleep and it's also involved in memory. So for example in songbirds, when the songbird hears a new song and its equivalent part of the substantia nigra and the dopamine system has to turn on to remember the song. But it needs a sleep as well. And because people can do the recordings it's somehow rather the sleep and the release of dopamine and the replaying of the song by the the memory systems seems to be able to consolidate that piece of memory so when the bird wakes up it can have the it can sing the song. We think that something similar happens in mammals and what we think happens in Parkinson's is because dopamine levels get low during sleep that the brain temporarily reconnects and so the normal sleep mechanisms arouse the motor systems and people start moving briefly and call out in their 
in their sleep. So it's not that the sleeping and the dreaming is disturbed, it's just that the connection and the disconnection is disturbed. And dopamine seems to be involved in that. So we haven't seen young people coming forward in great numbers yet using crystal meth, but from the earlier epidemics where people were using amphetamine in the US, uh, the lower levels as a drug drug related uh, use those have a, those people have a higher risk of parkinson's as as do people who are on antipsychotics in large numbers as well so it seems that um, stimulation of dopamine release uh, by the cell therefore that what we 're saying here is increasing the amount of dopamine in the cell does seem to put the nervous system that makes the part of the nervous system that makes that dopamine at greater risk. So there is a problem, most likely a long-term problem about use of um, uh, drugs like amphetamine which drive the dopamine system too hard. Up the back. I'm sorry, I'm, my hearing's a bit poor. Yep. So I'm wondering, you know, you were saying about it's an onset of the disease. Is that part of that or is it just more of a later? So the question was uh, about depression and Parkinson's. So depression is more common in Parkinson's than similar uh, neurological diseases which cause similar disability. And there's not clear what the mechanism for that is. So th it's quite common for there to have been a depressive element e episode that is unusual if you consider the life history of that person to have occurred before diagnosis. So there's a higher incidence of that. Um, there's also a higher incidence of anxiety and you're probably aware that anxiety and depression are common partners and often with uh, chronic anxiety leading to depression. So um, there's a number of theories that have been put forward and again none of them are clear. So, so I'll just actually say one other thing before I go into the theories. The third thing is that once Parkinson's is established, and particularly if the dopamine levels are going up and down, it's very common for there to be anxiety and depression on the falling levels of dopamine as well, with periods when it's off is turning on and people become anxious. Now that clearly, we're very certain that that's actually a biochemical process due to the falling dopamine itself and is probably different from the other two things that we're talking about. So one explanation for the increased anxiety is that, in, first, sorry, one explanation is first of all that there is increased anxiety and the increased anxiety drives the depression eventually and that's thought to be due to the idea that um, not only are movements done in chunks but so is thinking done in chunks and people find it a bit harder to actually organise what they're going to do and harder to think their way through it so that causes increased anxiety and drives the process. While I think that occurs I must say I'm not as convinced by that as an explanation and I suspect that the other explanation is the more likely one is that uh, not only is there disturbance in the dopamine system but it has a, an effect on some of the other related pathways which are involved in mood stability and mood fluctuation including the serotonin system. Um, so it, mostly people are not aware of it and uh, it mainly has been shown up by routine testing to show that and it's really a cross um, all odour discriminations rather than some in particular. And yes you're correct the s selectivity and sensitivity of the test is not good enough to make a diagnosis. So it's an indication that it's more common but since it's such a ubiquitous problem that comes with just simply having too many birthdays it sort of then sort of fits in with that same problem with constipation as well. So the question is, is it increasing? So it's again a little bit hard to actually say for sure and the reason being is that Parkinson's, the incidence of Parkinson's, that is the number of new cases or people who actually get diagnosed, 
increases quite dramatically from about 55 on, so that the um, incidence of people aged 60 is about 0.15% uh, and the incidence of people who are aged 75 to 80 is 4%. So as our community grows older, there is going to be more people with Parkinson's. Now that's not quite the same saying, thing as saying that Parkinson's is becoming more common because of uh, other factors driving that process. And so it's been very difficult to sort out just the effect of having greater success at all the other things that were killing people at a younger age and therefore revealing this risk as uh, people are now able to grow older or whether in fact there are things like um, environmental factors that we talked about like insecticides and so on are becoming more prevalent and therefore they're driving this process. So it's very unclear. Well, it's um, 7.30, we started promptly, we should finish promptly. So thank you again very much for coming. Thank you.